All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We'll have a few more people pop in as we go, but uh, I want to go ahead and get going here pretty quickly for everybody that got in on time. So today we're going to be talking about as-built structure scanning and modeling techniques uh, with some different tips and hacks worked in there. Uh, and this is going to be based off of uh, a number of case studies from some of our great customers. Uh, you'll see we've got Jake Allen, Robert DiDonato, and Greg Hale joining us. And uh, we'll do a little bit of a introduction here for the people we've got. Um, in terms of our agenda, uh, we'll do our introductions, talk about goals and context, and then uh, take a look at the Allen Construction Services case study, uh, and then uh, and then the uh, Hale Tip case study. And with that, um, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, participants are muted during the presentation. We'll open up for Q and A at the end. Uh, so for now, please ask questions via the chat window or the questions uh, in the GoToWebinar. And uh, we will be recording this webinar, so uh, if you have to pop out along the way or if there's anybody else you want to see it, uh, we'll send a link for the recording out at the end of the webinar for anyone that registered. Uh, so you'll be able to do that. So to do a quick introduction for our panelists here, we have Jake Allen, who is CEO of Allen Construction Services. Um, and you'll see that's a management and development uh, company with uh, different properties in the San Francisco Bay Area. Bay Area. And uh, Jake's been around the real estate industry for quite a while. Um, we have Robert DiDonato. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Robert. Um, and uh, so Robert has been uh, working in the CAD industry for a long time, has uh, owned CAD Works for for quite a while, and that's a that's a pretty low startup investment for a uh, for a company that's as big as you guys have grown. So uh, it's exciting to see. And then, of course, we have Greg Hale, uh, who's got 18 years of experience in BIM and structural engineering projects, uh, adjunct professor, and uh, as the uh, founder and leader of the Western New York AEC Tech User Group. So. Three great panelists today, and I am uh, Kelly Cohn. I'm your MC today, um, so uh, I'll be pretty quickly turning this over to the people that uh, can really talk about the projects, but uh, certainly familiar with the space as well, and uh, uh, looking, looking forward to uh, hearing the results from today. So, And with that, um, we want to... Go ahead and just get started. Uh, Jake and Robert, do you guys want to unmute yourself? Hello, I'm on. Good morning, this is Jake Allen. This is Robert. Oh, and, and you did pronounce my name correctly. It is D Donato. Hey, I'd rather be lucky than good. <laughs> All right, well, if you guys want, just go ahead and get started and let me know when to move on to the next slide. Hey, yeah, Allen, uh, do you want to start? Uh, Jake, you want to start? Um, since the scanning comes up first? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Jake Allen, and I, I run the uh, development arm of our uh, family holdings. Uh, and we work mostly out of the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, but we have holdings throughout Northern California. And uh, we started this project because the scanning was the only way that we could effectively produce a set of as-built plans on uh, what's the, the Macaulay Foundry in Berkeley, California. And Robert was the person who actually turned me on to the scanning technology and got me started in all of this. Six months ago, I didn't know about any of this, and now I'm a complete junkie for it. And to that, I'll hand it over to Robert. Yeah, so uh, we, uh, we've been scanning for a while. We, we did a few pr projects before this one. This one was so massive, uh, it just didn't make sense to go out and try to measure things by hand. Um, so uh, Jake got on board with scanning and he started, uh, he actually took on the scanning himself, uh, kind of took a crash course in it and uh, went at it and uh, I couldn't believe how fast he picked up on it. Um, and next thing you know, we were over 900 scans, I think we're close to 1,000 at this point. Um, we can go to the next slide. So.
So this was the this is the interior um, gal uh, cathedral, as we call it. Um, so Jake, you want to explain how you scan this um, t time wise and your methods? Absolutely, yes. So th this is a uh, it's a building that's a, a little over 100 years old. They started building it in 1906, and they built it through 1980. And of course, nobody did anything like keep an accurate set of plans around. Um, we took this building over, and when we took it over, we went to the city of Berkeley, and we wanted to, of course, change it from what it was. We don't want to change the zoning. We wanted to just change the sizing of everything. So we started out with um, that we went in and started scanning. And our scanning included taking each one of these individual spaces and doing number of scans in order to be able to, to look accurately at what was there structurally, how it had been built, and then how everything was connected together. We spent uh, about six weeks working on the scans to do that many scans, and we were able to effectively produce the entire project covered. Uh, we used the uh, Faro uh, X330 scanner to do this. We set it on, uh, it was four times quality. It was taking between eight minutes, about eight minutes to do a scan. In hindsight, I would have taken more time on the scans and taken up to 11 minutes to do them. Uh, and I probably would have done a few more just to make sure that we were actually able to capture all of the details as necessary. Um, what we were looking for out of this was an as-built set of drawings that we could give to the city of Berkeley. And when we first started shopping around, we it was amazing what people wanted to produce that set of as-built drawings and uh, how long it was going to take to do that. It turned out that doing it this way saved us a tremendous amount of time and money in being able to do it. Um, we did scans that were approximately every 40 feet in this large open area, the cathedral space that, that, that you can kind of see here. And this included a mixture of steel and timber. And using edgewise, we were able to extract both of those out and get them as um, accurately as to what was actually there. Um, we could uh, we can go on to the next scan. Yeah, so one of our challenges was that uh, it was hard to determine what kind of structural elements are in this building because it had been modified so many times. So it was almost surprising you're kind of going along and you're, you know, um, you're you know, modeling up steel and all of a sudden um, Courage pops up a timber beam, which looked like a steel beam. So we were able to identify all the different types of structural elements throughout, uh, throughout this throughout the whole project pretty easily. Um, and it was just a, just a massive amount of structure. But that's the only part we actually did was structural. We, hadn't, we didn't dive into the piping. But, um, uh, and again, this isn't actually finished yet. We're, we're, we're still working on it. We're, we're probably at about 90%. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide? So this is uh, one of the finished products from, uh, by taking Edgewise and being able to, to identify elements um, in structural parts of the of this of the cathedral we were able to modify our families build a trust system um, and able to we were able to size everything correctly um, the uh, let's, let's go to the uh, next slide so you can see how much timber uh, again it's not done we still have some roofs to put on um, we're still working on this one and we still have that central area there to, to complete but you can see all the different parts. It was so difficult to bring this into um, uh, uh, a Revit uh, by itself. So by being able to use Edgewise, identify our parts, export it to Revit, and then bring it in, generate our families, and start building a project, it went. It really bumped uh, bumped up the productivity and speed of getting this project done. Uh, next slide. Here you can start to see some of the complexity that we were dealing with uh, in the cathedral area. Again, it's a big mixed bag of different types of structural elements. Um, just a lot going on in there, and it was just just the slides alone were very difficult to to determine, uh, you know, what was actually there. So again, Edgeway was tremendous in helping us figure out what was actually in this in these structures. Uh, next slide. 
we had actually looked at, we, we were expecting to do about 120 days of modeling on this, and after we got into Edgewise, we realized that we were going to be able to do that modeling. We did most of the modeling in, in, in about 30 days. Uh, and, and it really did change what the cost of this project was to get this piece of it done. And it was, it, it, it was unbelievable at how much faster it was to do this with Edgewise and how accurate it brought everything into the Revit models to actually create the final product. And this is kind of the, this is the overall uh, site, uh, looking at it from a structural sort of viewpoint. Um, just so much going on. Um, again, just a tremendous tool to use for structural. There's no way that we could have gotten to this and just Revit alone based on those slides. Um, and then the thing that we learned about this is, is when you have close to a thousand slides, you create a huge amount of data. And it, it, when you have that much data, you really have to figure out how are you going to process it, where is it going to live, who's going to have access to it, and why do they have access to it, so that you can make sure that you get through stuff. We were originally using Dropbox, and I had somebody that went on and deleted everything on Dropbox. And I was like, well, no longer going to do that. Um, but it, 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 the, the data is everything, and if you're not keeping track of that and who has access to it, it's a problem. But it's, it, it, it is what creates the ability to get all of this type of stuff done and allows us to create this beautiful as-built project when we're finished that actually represents everything that's here. We can go on to the next slide. Yeah, so I think you touched on this. I, um, I did, yeah. Uh, so next slide. And with that, okay. actually, I think we're gonna um, we'll we'll go ahead and move on and let uh, let Greg Hale talk about his project, and then we'll we'll cycle back for questions on both projects at the end. So uh, so thank you guys very much. And uh, Greg, you want to unmute yourself? All right, I'm back on. Can you hear me, Kelly? I can indeed. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks, guys. That that uh, facility looks absolutely awesome. I'm a little jealous. It's a pretty big project to handle, and and uh, I'm sure you guys are anxious to get get that done done with. Uh, it's sure a, a long way to project. Um, so to continue on here, uh, my name is Greg Hale. I am a company owner for Hale Technology and Practice. Started up the company. Uh, just about four years ago, almost. We're headquartered in Rochester, New York, so someplace other than New York City, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with New York State. Um, we provide all sorts of things that generally revolve around BIM as the, the central uh, theme of the company, so universal design and construction services, BIM management, 3D laser scanning, BIM modeling coordination, and training and implementation. Uh, it really started uh, as a heart of using Revit, and then different kinds of technology started to you know, propagate from Revit as that central piece. Now, so over the, the last four years, uh, we've completed over 100 projects, some of them small, some of them big, and uh, there's quite a wide variety of, of expertise within the firm. All right. So the, the project that we're going to talk about today is uh, one that we did late last year in Michigan. Um, it was a facility that uh, due to uh, reasons for the customer, it cannot be named. Um, everybody's always a little bit sensitive about their facilities, but it is in Michigan, definitely known for their manufacturing in the state. Um, the facility is about 120,000 square feet in total. Uh, over the history of that particular building, it had been uh, originally a steel fabrication shop and then taken over by a couple of different people over time into some different warehousing and manufacturing facilities. So they've done a couple different changes to it over time. Um, the current client that was moving into that building was going to be an airline engine manufacturing company. And they really needed to know what was in there, where was it at, what sizing it was, because they had all sorts of, of crazy plans for it. And you know, traditional methods you know, would be going in there with either just a laser measure or a total station or uh, 
uh, you know, other other measurements, more traditional measurement tools, and taking a good amount of time to lay things out. And oftentimes that would be done you know, fairly inaccurately, uh, fairly rough, uh, and then they would kind of figure things out as they go along the field. And then, of course, as we all know, those end up in change orders. So the, the particular engineering firm that we were working for has been really hot on the topic of laser scanning. So they immediately called us and had us come in. And just like many other projects that we deal with, it's uh, we know we just called you today, but can you be there next week? Um, so I'm sure we've we've all been through those. So we jumped through a few hoops and made it happen. Um, so you can see a couple of images there uh, of the the project site. The image on the top is seen aerial data. It looks very similar to what you get on something like a Google Earth. You jump in there, look to a 3D view. Uh, but we're actually able to take that information out to a 3D point cloud. That was one of the tools that we used, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. And then <clears throat> the image that you see down below is basically a direct laser scanning image out of Ferrocene. Uh, the scanning that we took inside the facility was uh, all black and white. We didn't take any color. It wasn't going to add any value in this particular case. Um, but some of the things that they were really interested in for the structure were the, the sizing of the beams, because they wanted to go ahead and stick some new crane rails in, uh, and the engineers want to be able to test the capacity of that existing structure. And they knew that some different things had happened over the history of that building, so it was really kind of critical for that to happen. And then it just to, to complete the overall assets, um, we went ahead and did all of the existing architecture. There was a series of boxes in there, also the, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, anything that was visible in the space and not hidden behind the walls. And then, of course, the challenge with measuring a space like this is traditional methods. To measure all those steel trusses that you see in that image, you'd have to be up on a, on a lift or get up there with uh, some tie-offs and kind of walk that steel and take some of those measurements. And of course, we didn't want to do that, and we know that laser scanning is a great option for this. You just need to get enough good perspective on those items. And then to top it off, not only did we have to be on the site really quick, but they also needed a quick turnaround, so inside of two weeks. So. Some might say that's an insane deadline. So we were on site within a week. Um, two weeks from that point, we were to, to go ahead and try to deliver that rabbit model for them. We had an initial bag to get them started on some very initial work that they started inside of a week, but then we had to, to complete things on within another. Um, and those high bays were a little bit difficult. The When I say complex trust work, a lot of people will go ahead and assume that Every truss is the same, but as I mentioned, over the history of the building, things have changed a little bit, and they had also had some previous crane rails built in there, so certain members were beefed up or changed out, and so the assumption that everything was going to be the same and quick was not quite the case, and I'm sure you guys with the, the previous project in the presentation came across the same kind of information as you will in most facilities. Um, so, and of course, there's no drawings in the facility. Uh, we could definitely generate a floor plan pretty quickly, but we really needed all that information up in the, the, the roof framing there. All right, next slide. So some of the tools that we used here. Um, tools and, and team. There were two of us that went out to the project site. Uh, we hit it up with two, scan, two scanners to get it done quick and easy. We found or actually find often in our workflow that when you put two scanners on a job site at once, it's actually more than double the productivity just because there's a lot of efficiencies. You know, you get to the project site, uh, you start to get oriented, and you have two guys there. They can start to troubleshoot. They can uh, change around the plan really quick. And then when you start leapfrogging, you start ending up with a lot more efficiencies uh, with your setup. So you're actually a, a lot less setup time, and you, you start to kind of play off each other. And I would say, it's almost about two and a half times as fast to use two people at once than it is just, just a double multiplier. So we used Ferro scanners in-house. Um, both of those were X330 scanners. You certainly could have used a sort, shorter range, but that's the, the tool that we have in our toolbox. Um, for most of these projects, we'll use spheres uh, for the registration process in the scanning. Uh, we did not necessarily have to have a survey control on the site. It wasn't quite big enough to, to require it, but it's a good practice. And we had access to a surveyor who was also in the project performing survey on it. So we had uh, had him shoot some additional targets for us, and we went ahead and tied that registration and the survey control together, and we had everything on the same port system with the engineers, the architects. Uh, over about a day and a half, we took 350 scans. 
so it was relatively quick. Um, we also did not want to get on top of that roof. So we were just starting to get into the drone work at that particular point in time, so we brought along our drone. We took a look at what it was going to take to get on the roof and just how much data was up there and decided it was a good application. So rather than getting on the roof with a scanner and getting all the equipment up there, we went ahead and just flew it with the drone. And we, we tied that information together, creating a point cloud from the drone and tying it together with a laser scan from it as well. All right, next slide, Kelly. So from that, you can see kind of more of a, a final image here. The particular software we're using here is Fuser, which is a, a tie-in to Revit. It just helps you kind of live render your model without having to hit a render button and wait. But you can see all the trust members that are in there, all the steel framing. And again, like you would, you would assume that all of these steel members were exactly the same, but we actually found quite a bit of variation. And it's pretty difficult, difficult to go through all of those measurements uh, and find those. We used Edgewise to do that. I right, go ahead and take a look at the next slide here, Kelly. So what I have here is an example of the pipe extraction uh, that we ran through uh, Edgewise. And what you're seeing here is actually quite a bit more than the actual piping that was in there, but you see all the main runs that are kind of grouped together. So there was some false positives. We were able to clear those out plenty quick. Um, we've, we've learned to do that quite well. But one of the instances I want to show you here is this is the automatic extraction just for those specific piping tools. And this would take a substantial amount of time to go through and trace and find each of those elements. And one of the key things that you want to decide when you're doing these kinds of projects is, are you trying to get the exact as-built condition or are you trying to get something approximate and maybe you're just kind of doing an array of a similar object? When you're trying to capture these things and they're truly where they are at, you really need something that's extracting it in their true location. This is where Edgewise really comes in and plays out really well. Is if you could go ahead and extract one and figure out a common thing and, and just array it across the project, but in this case, we're getting actual locations. Uh, the other reason I'm showing this is at the end of our projects, we actually typically purge out the Edgewise file set because we don't necessarily need it once we have a final project. Um, so in this case, I actually went back and ran a full uh, edgewise extraction on the pipes to show you what you automatically get without any other additional input. Okay, go ahead, Kelly. So on the, the structure side, we it was all um, individual extraction. Went through and, and modeled all those. Here's more of a final product with some of the piping. It wasn't necessarily the the primary aspect or goal of the project. You can see uh, tied in with all the fire sprinklers. Those are all truly located. They are not arrayed across the project. And then the other thing that people often miss with the edgewise tools is the ground extraction. And I actually use the ground extraction on almost every one of my projects. Um, so what that does is it extracts a, a, a land XML file, and you can bring that into Revit using the Site Designer add-in tool, um, which is free through the Autodesk website. And it's going to bring in a really nice, easy topography with uh, needing very little editing to get that in there. So all we did in that particular image that you see there is split up those topography regions into asphalt, sidewalks, grass, and we could go ahead and throw some uh, some trees on there, et cetera. And it really helps keep that building in context, especially if they have to go ahead and regrade or if they're doing any kind of an addition and understand how it's going to impact the site. It often gets overlooked. So as far as the extraction goes, the pipe slide that you saw before took about eight hours to extract those 350 scans. So typically we just set that up on a night. Um, let that run, or if we have an extra machine laying around, we'll go ahead and let that run without anybody using it. And then that, that was the automatic extraction of the pipes there, so it's a fantastic tool. There was also some minimal ducting that we did in there, which is going to work very similarly to the structure tools. The, uh, the pattern extraction of the steel, we did start with that, and we went back and had to QC it some more, because like I said, we found a lot more variations in that. As far as the modeling time goes, we basically had the same two guys that went out and scanned provide the, the Revit modeling. There's huge advantages to this. Um, this can get quite overlooked. Uh, if you're ever using a, a third-party modeler and you're sending them scan work, the scans are great, and they're certainly a, a much higher level than you would get with traditional measurement, but you cannot beat 
being out in the project site and understanding what that facility is. So it's an enormous advantage to have the modelers be the scanners at the same time and understand how to pull these things together. So overall modeling time took us two weeks. Of that, that couple of weeks, it was 28 man hours just to work in the Edgewise platform. So this is really before you even get into Revit is you start extracting you know, the pipes, those ducts we showed, the, the structure, and then you start assembling things in Revit. And overall, it was about 128 hours of modeling. Um, definitely much more accurate to model. As I mentioned, you need to understand, do you need to know exactly where those objects are, or are you just trying to get something close? There's a, a big difference. It also affects your productivity when you're creating a 3D model of that facility. So really understanding the scope of the work and what someone is intending to do with it makes a big difference. And of course, if you're using an extraction software, the QA tools within it are, are very helpful in understanding uh, if you're working with something like a column or a beam in this case, is that deflecting? Are you map modeling it for those true life as is conditions? Because I can tell you at every facility that's out there, it's not plumb, and it's not straight, and it's not flat. So there has to be some kind of uh, understanding of what the true conditions are. So those QA tools <coughs> inside of those extraction softwares will help that. And then with this image, there's all of these trusses here. And as many of you know who have, doing, have been doing 3D scanning and modeling, it's hard to get that information into a Revit family. So what we did in this scenario was we brought all of these extracted pieces of steel pulled them into the Revit project environment, we made a group out of that, and then extracted that group out to a native Revit family, and then loaded that back in as a typical Revit family, and then made some variations based on additional extractions of steel. So there is a way to get the point cloud information extracted and over into a Revit family as opposed to just in the Revit environment. So we get it out to Revit families, and then just as a, a back note, you know, compared to the two weeks that it did take us, we kind of predicted there, there's no way of telling exactly it would have taken about three weeks to do this without those tools. And even on a, a smaller scale project like this, it, uh, it's a substantial difference in fee there. So we like to think both time and money are worth worth that that weight in gold. So overall, 140 man hours versus what we had predicted about 220 man hours. That's where those extraction tools really help out really help you become more productive in that workflow. And, and like I said, time is money. Really, people care more about that time frame in a lot of instances than they do about the actual cost. They're usually willing to pay a little bit more, and, and especially be, be really happy with you if they can get that project done on time. That's really the key indicator to take. We get that done in a couple of weeks. If not, if not, let's throw either more people at it or whatever. But in this case, you can keep a, a small workforce and get a lot done at the same time. And then the, the key indicator here as well is, is not just that, that update in time savings, but we ended up with a more accurate model because we're using extraction software, which is a little better at, or say a lot better than the human workflow, where we tend to approximate things a little too much. And then some tips kind of drawn from this. Um, you know, as mentioned before, don't assume that all structural bays are the same. I've done enough structural engineering to know that you know, if they were that easy, you could hire anybody to do this, and they would come up with a typical facility, and then you know, you'd have all sorts of trouble uh, with these additional things like cranes and extra loads and the can equipment you'd have to throw in there. So there's always that variation that you have to look out for. You can't assume that everything is going to be exactly the same. So be very careful with the pattern and scratch. Um, definitely understand what that model is used for. When I go into a situation for a scanning project, I almost always get the question, we have this building, we want you to scan it, how much is it going to cost? And I never answer that question directly with an answer, it's with another question, it's, well, what do you intend on doing with this project? Because that's going to affect how we approach it and just how accurate we need to be. So that discussion needs to be had because, you know, in there things are just not plumb, they're not square, and we need to know whether they, need, they care or not with the particular scope they're working with. Look out for any of the, the major steel deflections. Um, even when you're extracting things manually uh, through any of these extraction tools, you really have to look out for the variations there. It's going to give you a best approximation. And during that scoping uh, session, you need to understand, are we trying to define where the connections are at, where that true beam is at, 
if it's deflecting, is that going to affect things like class section if we're running new piping and ductwork and services through those facilities? So I talked about creating um, in-place families. So in-place families in Revit will work phenomenally. There is a way to get it out of an in-place family and into a Revit loadable family. So you can use that workflow. You can um, speed that up by creating those typical rep families and then using those throughout the project. And of course, best recommendation for a scanning and modeling team, don't divorce those two people. Keep them the same because you'll find much better productivity, much better understanding of the project, and you're, you're going to end up with a much better result to give out to the client. And then just a, a note to leave on, uh, something that we've been playing a little bit with the ClearEdge 3D team is the Verity tool. So this is something that they just launched recently. And this is more of a QC tool meant on the construction QA, QC process, but you can use it in this laser scanning process to find out more specifically or analytically where these deviations are at, even based upon your assumptions, your modeling. So it's going to be a great tool for that, even though that may not necessarily be its perfect or, or first intention. I think it's a great second use of it. So definitely venture into that and take a peek and give it a trial run and see what that can do for you and making sure you're getting good quality results with your scan and modeling data. That should wrap it up for me for now and leave it open for some questions. All righty, and we will switch gear to questions. Again, if you have any and you haven't already sent them in, you can use the uh, questions in the or, or the chat window in the GoToMeeting, uh, GoToWebinar window. Uh, type them in, and we'll queue them up. And with that, we'll start going through a couple of the questions here. So um, I want to cycle back uh, to um, uh, Jake and Robert here and take uh, ask a couple questions about the project. So. Uh, first one, did you use any uh, total station uh, or other survey equipment for survey control? No, we did not. <clears throat> we just uh, we were able to line things up close enough uh, for what we were trying to get. Um, or we were looking more for architectural as-built set of drawings, and that's, we didn't really have a structural component, or we didn't really have a survey component that was that important. So we, were, you know, uh, we kind of just jumped into it, and we were able to make it accurate enough. Excellent. Um, and then also you mentioned uh, that, you know, you got it done in 30 days versus 120. Um, but what was the size of the project team? How many, um, you know, how many scan, or sorry, let's just start, stop there. There's kind of two questions in one there. So what was the size of the project team? Um, as far as the modeling was one with me to begin with. Um, and so once we got edgewise, we were able to, uh, Get some, get some more members on the team, and that really um, expedited the effort. So I think, Jake, how many uh, total guys do we have working on this now? Four. We have a total of four. Okay. Um, and again, once we got into this, um, the, we expected 120 days, but at, the more you dig into this, you kind of open Pandora's box, and you find more and more stuff. In fact, we even found a room that nobody knew about uh, that was hidden uh, within the structures, and, and that was found because we were able to scan it and and look at the plans and say, hey, you know what, there's a volume here that we don't know how to get to. And it was actually a hidden hidden room that somebody was using uh, by unscrewing a panel or something to get in there. Uh, but anyhow, so yeah, so um, it's um, it, 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 the estimate of 120 days uh, probably should have been higher uh, with, without, without Edgewise, but with Edgewise it definitely sped things up. Excellent. And then, uh, again, how many scans did you have in this in one scene project? I know you had 990 total, but did you break that up into multiple projects, or was that just one large project? It was broken up into, into multiple projects. What we did was, was took each section, so like um, the cathedral section, which is the piece that we've got here, was about 80 scans altogether, and that was all registered in scene and then export it out in, in various ways. So we exported this in the FLS files that you can do it as, and we also exported it out in Recap. And then we, and we had enough overlap to, uh, to line things up. Now, you know, it's with, within reason. So we're talking maybe a quarter inch or so. It wasn't that much variation, and it wasn't enough for us to uh, be too concerned about, um, you know, how, how close those overlaps were. Excellent. All right. Um, 
Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, in, in this project, it was, it was essentially 15 different buildings that were all tied together by common roof. So what we did was take each one of those pieces and then put that into a group of scans in both first and second and roof, first floor, second floor, roof, and exterior. And then we were able to tie all of those together um, in scene and then tie each one of those projects together uh, in Revit. Awesome. All righty, uh, and then just one clarification, the 30 days of modeling, was that just the structure or the entire model? Just structure. Nope. All right. Um, now I'm going to switch over here and ask uh, Greg a question. Can you explain the difference between BIM management and BIM modeling and coordination? Okay, uh, let's see, BIM management. So. A lot of that is um, setting up a, a company or a team to understand the process and the planning of a project, whereas um, modeling and coordination, so modeling is, is physically just more like a drafting effort, and the coordination is, is coordinating those three-dimensional, so it's like a spatial coordination is a term that's commonly used in the industry. So management can be more about process um, than the actual production, I guess, if you put it that way. And so there's there's all sorts of planning, uh, team planning, management skills that go along with it, um, as well as knowing and understanding the software. So it's both the technical expertise as well as the management expertise. All right. And then can you tell us a little about the software that you were using for the visualization here? Right, so Fuser, F-U-Z-O-R, is a plug-in for Revit, which is meant for a, a rendering and virtual reality experience. experience. Uh, so as you are running Revit, you basically turn on this plug-in. Typically, people will run this with two monitors, and they'll have it up on the, on the second monitor, and it will render your project live at the same time. So it's using a gaming engine or, uh, to, to render that. As well as many with, with the, a lot of these rendering tools now, you can throw on a virtual reality headset, something like an Oculus Rift or an HTC Vive, and you can actually navigate or walk through that space. And what's really cool about this is that now you can, as you model this, if you look at this from the perspective of a 3D modeler and scanner, now you can actually walk it and then QC it through a VR experience as opposed to walking through it in something like Navisworks. And I can tell you from, from first-hand experience of doing this now, it's even a whole other level above being able to walk through that space. And if, if you were the one who scanned it, you can kind of revisit that again. It's like, hey, you know what? I remember there being that piece of equipment there or something. And you go back, yes, and you and you look back at the scan data, and you're, like, you're right, I missed something. So it's really great to be able to rewalk the, the floor virtually. And then the other kicker, or actually there's two other kickers with this software, is you can put point clouds in it, and you can run the rendering with the point cloud and in VR. And then also, as you make changes in the VR environment, you can save those and kick those back into Revit. So works really well for people like interior designers who want to design inside of a rendering environment and then kick that information back into Revit um, seamlessly. All righty. So, and very then, cool uh, yeah, and I, I've, I've actually used that uh, in my former life, and it was a big fan. Um, so one other question for you, Greg. What software did you use to process the uh, the drone data, the photogrammetry? So for the photogrammetry, that was uh, Pix4D, and that was also taken. Uh, we ended up doing it two different ways. We brought that uh, based upon the survey coordinate system and uh, tied that in in Ferrocene. And then we also looked at uh, tying that it's in via cloud to cloud comparably with the uh, the point cloud driven from the drone data to the ferrocene data um, and doing a cloud to cloud registration between the, they call that the drone uh, point cloud is the unstructured data with the ferrocene is the structured data. So we're combining those two and registering the two together. So we tried them both and they both worked really well. I think definitely as a fallback, it's, it's much better to have that safeguard of the um, the survey control on the site and tying those together that way. Gotcha. 
And so, uh, actually, I've got a couple questions for everybody. Um, so, uh, and just a, one quick clarification um, for uh, for Jake and Robert: Did, Were you using Scene to do the registration as well on your project? Yes, we. we I, I use Scene to, to register uh, about ninety percent of it. There was one building that we used uh, uh, the Autodesk recap on, but everything else was registered in Scene. Gotcha. Ken, Ken and Greg, I'd like you to chime in on this as well, but we had a couple of people ask about experience with, you know, why, why it was registered in scene versus uh, being registered in recap. Um, so to be honest, we have, we have never gotten quite as good a result at a recap. So we've stuck with scene to this day so far. Um, plus we, we tend to still stick with the, um, using the spheres for registration as opposed, as opposed to the cloud to cloud. And in this scenario, uh, the picture that we're looking at right now, I still think it's the right application. And then Jake, did you, uh, did you or Robert have any comment on that? We, we used, uh, I actually, uh, the uh, Pharaoh sent out a trainer and they, uh, I was using the spheres to begin with. And then when he came out, he goes, no, you don't need to use those. You can just, as long as you've got an overlap that does it. And we switched to using the, we were doing enough scans to get the overlap. But almost everything that we've got done here came in at less than three millimeters of variance on, on a group of scans. So I was very happy with, with how well scene worked. And the one project that we used in recap, one building that I was able to do there um, worked uh worked well enough that, that it was a newer section and, and it worked well enough to uh, to uh, use and recap. But I would say that that, that, that Scene did deliver a better product than uh, than the Autodesk recap did. All righty. Um, so we've got kind of a general question as well. Uh, we've 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 shown some industrial projects here today. Um, can, can any of the panelists speak to experience uh, utilizing 3D scanning or BIM uh, to help manage uh, monuments or heritage sites? Sure. It's actually part of the architectural process now. And we are using the scans that we got off of this as a way of, of um, putting this through the, uh, the uh, historical process for the city of Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Greg, you were going to say something? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've certainly done a lot of historical preservation projects, and there's just a, a huge leap in comparison to, you know, what your, I'll call it your standard designer will do. And I, I can tell you, uh, people will laugh at me saying this, but when you measure a building, these guys will count bricks. And so there's a, a huge difference between counting bricks and getting laser scan data, and now you're down to millimeter accuracy. Plus, we capture so much more data than is conceivable with the naked eye with individual laser measures or tape measures. So it's, it's a fantastic application. Um, once I started doing this, and I was actually it started in more of the historical preservation, there was no turning back whatsoever. I'll, even the small projects, uh, little house additions, I'll bring my laser scanner out for it and help somebody out. I just don't do it on their way. Excellent. And then could uh, could each of you, each company chime in real quick on what their preferred settings are uh, for laser scanning? Uh, Jake, you you did, you did most of the scanning, so you uh, you prefer you thought it might be better to up up it a little bit, correct? I I, I did prefer to take a higher quality scan. I, I just find it's easier to work with the data once you get it. Uh, our scans were taking about 11 minutes. It was four times quality, and um, I don't remember what the other setting was on it right now, and I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, so this, this is Greg. I mean, this, this is certainly a loaded question. It really depends on the, the type of work for the project. Uh, you know, definitely with a larger scale project like this with a Faro scanner, um, you, you want to keep a high quality. It does depend upon the materials that you're scanning as well. So if there's something like stainless in this, you're going to get a lot more noise based upon the reflectancy of that, that laser. So you want a higher quality setting there, which is going to take more time, you know, higher distances, which is going to take more time. And then, of course, there's that addition of photos. So 
generally speaking, we take most scans outside in color and most scans inside in black and white without the color. But it does depend upon the scope of the work of the project and whether or not we need to see the variations of color for things like materials or not. So it really depends upon the project. Um, the other thing that we, we do look at, um, have looked in, at studies based upon quality settings of the ferro scanners. And for typical dull materials, you really don't get good measurable or better results out of a higher quality scan. Um, so we tend to take more perspectives and lower the quality of the scans so that we can actually capture essentially more data and then just a you know, smidgen of a fraction of less accuracy. Okay. Um, and then uh, for, for Jake and Robert, uh, with almost a thousand scans, can you talk about the, the, the size of the files that were generated? Like how much data do you have to manage? Jake, I think we're... Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm the one who keeps most of the data, and we have approaching four terabytes of data at this point in time with all the various pieces and the various ways that we've saved it. So when it comes out of scene, it gets saved to a dot .fls. When you save it into recap, it's the dot, a dot .rcp. And then, of course, you run it through clear edge. It creates another one. Each one creates, and, and when you finally get to Revit, it, it creates a, it gets smaller as you go along, but a, 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 there's there's a huge amount of data that comes out of something like this. Yeah. And, I, and I, I would agree with Greg. Um, it really depends on what you're scanning. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a loaded question. For us, it was better to bump it up uh, because of the distances and the in intricacies of all the structures uh, and the things you just miss um, if, you don't, if you don't have a higher quality scan. But... Uh, it's certainly okay to lower your, your um, you know, make the scan smaller and take more of them from different perspectives because then you'll get more sides of different objects. You, you have more of a clear, probably a bigger picture, but we weren't, um, time-wise, we, you know, we were okay with spending extra time with, with bumping up our, our quality. All righty. Um, now I've got a couple a couple specific questions about edgewise here, so anyone can jump in and answer these. Um, but uh, how do you uh, so Greg, I think how, how do you handle something like a wall that is out of plane? Can you describe the process of getting that into Revit? So for yeah, for something like a wall, it, it really depends upon if you're using the extraction software. Um, we'll often uh, for highly repetitive projects, we'll actually use the, the building tools inside of Edgewise, and those have a series of QC tools built into them to look at the variation based upon the placement, and you can go through and refine that based upon that automatic extraction. So that's one way to look at it, and it's, it's more or less like a color, you know, people use the term heat map, to kind of show you that variation in it. So you can look at that. For others that are not quite as repetitive, we find it a little bit better to do some manual extraction of those. Um, there are some additional tools and add-ins, whether they be in Revit or AutoCAD, to look at that variation. Um, but it really does depend upon that scope of the work for the project. Generally, I tell the, uh, the client that, that walls are probably one of the most inaccurate things that are out there. If you go into any typical house, you'll find that every wall with its drywall on it moves in and out at least a half an inch. And that's just because of the extra mud that's on there at the corners or at seams. And so people tend to overspec their accuracy and say that, you know, we're going to provide this model at quarter-inch accuracy when construction tolerances are way above that. So we try to kind of quell the expectations there and say, oh, you know, there's going to be a lot of walls. But if they're inside of maybe an inch or so, we're going to keep them orthogonal and plumb. If we find something that's really out of whack that's going to affect your scope of work that you're working with, we're going to red flag it and we're going to model it that way for you. And I can tell you on a, on a few different older historical projects where walls were not straight or plumb or square and we started modeling it that way, you know, it was the right thing to do in that scenario, but the architect had to fit because now as they're drawing, everything is out of plane. But it is what it is and it really needed, it was going to affect the scope of the work that they were trying to do. So it was a good thing, but it really starts to you know, change up a workflow in a sense that, that's working with people. So, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to go about it, but you want to be honest about the expectations up front and the fact that those things are not plumb and true. Yeah. 
And so we have a question on, uh, you know, is there a best practice cheat sheet, uh, you know, on this kind of workflow? And um, there, there is actually a, 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 an industry group, the U.S. Institute of Building Documentation, USIVD, uh, that has a number of kind of standardized documents on, you know, expectations, requirements, uh, level of accuracy. Uh, so I would definitely, you know, reference anyone in the audience that's working in this kind of scan to BIM workflow to familiarize yourself with those documents. They also have some things to help write proposals. Um, but those, you know, those are probably the closest thing there exists, you know, that exists to a standard that I'm aware of. Um, Greg or uh, uh, Jake, Robert, any uh, any other comments on that? Yeah, it really depends on what you're after. I mean, if, um, yeah, it, it drives you crazy to see a column that's, you know, a couple of inches off from the top to the bottom because in plan it just doesn't print right. Um, so you kind of, I, I found the best way to do it is just to make sure your connection points are, are pretty accurate. Um, our beams were kind of bending in and out, um, and there's no way you're going to go through the trouble of massing all that stuff uh, correctly because it's the, it, the plans aren't going to look right. It's, it's not going to really get you what you're after, I think. So for us, uh, making sure our endpoints, our elevations are correct, our connection points are correct, and then kind of true everything up and, and get and get the, this cathedral here is on the grid, actually. Um, so it is it is square and true, and it's averaged out that's close enough for what, for what we want. So uh, you really have to ask yourself what you're after is, is really what the, uh, is what the answer to that question is. Yeah. And so uh, we also, we also use for our subcontractors on this, we asked them to produce to a level of development of 300, uh, which was something that was produced, uh, I believe, by the BIM industry uh, and, and it had different levels on there that, that, we, that you know, producing it uh, the highest level showed all the way down to the connections at level 300 it gave us what we needed which was the to be able to get the structural and, and architectural out of this a, a, as needed yeah so the 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 bim lod specification is uh, is something that's uh, been published and spoken a lot about at the bim forum and uh, it is a joint uh, joint effort really between the agc um, aia and some other industry bodies uh, that you're referencing there. So that's, that is another good thing to look on the modeling side uh, as well, definitely. Um, so for Greg, are there modeling standards that give a proper workflow to fit your point clouds into a library of objects, or is that all included in Edgewise? Yeah, so on the Edgewise side, there, uh, those things uh, that are extracted are actually coming from a database. So if you're extracting pipes, there's going to be a, a particular database, there may be an international standard that may be different in the U.S. than others. There is, uh, they've done a good job with creating these databases. There, uh, there is also on the steel side things like a couple of historical databases for steel members that you can pull in, and you can also customize them. Um, so if you run across some situations, and I, I've done a few of these, but like a, a massive beam, and maybe it wasn't part of a standard database, but you know it comes out of a book somewhere you can actually just build that into that spreadsheet, uh, export that out, and then pull that into Edgewise to extract that information. So if you know you're dealing with a certain set of elements, you can build the, your own database and bring it in. And that, that really goes to feature extraction in and of itself is the ones that can be built with feature extraction are the ones that can be built off of the database. But there are a lot of things out there, especially with those historical preservation projects that aren't in any database. And that's where the, the expert modelers really come in and, and understand more of the craftsmanship side of things. So for all the repetitive tasks, definitely use the feature extraction software and the databases and the rest of the stuff. You're kind of on your own. There's a few other tricks, but um, it, it takes a little more expertise. Gotcha. And then uh, just for anyone, um, you know, how do you deal with uh, conditions that are out of plumb, deflected, irregular surfaces, uh, you know, particularly with beams, piping, things like that? Um, you know, is there, is there some way to set standard tolerances for idealizing that output in edgewise? Hmm. 
So yeah, I mean, you can you can look at that. The uh, one of the great quality settings in there, uh, I know on the, the piping side, is looking at the root mean square error and seeing how far off that is. And there's also a manual check to go through that QC. Um, you can kind of set your own limits. I can give you an example of, of piping. You're going to have a lot of extracted pipe, and you may have in your spec that you're going to extract everything larger than, let's say, one inch. But when you end up in your, your database or your list of automatically extracted features, you might have a lot of pipe in there that's uh, 0.96 inches. And so you have to make the judgment call, okay, exactly where do you draw the line? And say, well, we'll keep this and throw away that. It's a very difficult question to answer. And oftentimes what we, we fall back on is what, what do we have good data on and what don't we? So we'll often do things like conduits uh, and others, even though they might be three-quarter inch, and we'll either mass it out as a, as a conduit bank, or we'll actually, because Edgewise does a pretty good job getting a lot of it, we'll allow that to run and kind of show that as a conduit bank with individual conduits, but know that that's a little less accurate. We know we to, to miss that whole bank. Um, as far as standards go, this is probably the, the single most difficult crux of the entire industry. I know Kelly and I have talked about it many times before. It's, it's a really hard judgment call. You really have to understand the scope of the work and what's important for it because you can model to, to no end the accuracy of a project, and then that comes really down to meshing an entire building, which just isn't, isn't practical. So it's finding that balance, understanding the scope, defining the expectations to the client, and then really to be red flagging and then communicating anything that's going to affect that scope. Yeah. And, and, you know, just as kind of a, a product manager answer here, um, you know, there are a lot of tools in the application that help with that, whether it's things like the error, the errors in the uh, smart sheets, some of the different QA tools. There are also some automatic tools uh, that will go up and clean up pipe runs and kind of optimize based on these kind of tolerances that you want to set. So if you're okay with the pipe sagging an inch, you can define that and we'll let that represent as a single piece of pipe. If you need it down to a quarter inch, we'll break it up into smaller chunks of pipe, for instance. So um, definitely lots of tools for that. And with that, we are actually at time. Uh, so I think we will wrap up today. We do have a number of questions we didn't quite get to. Thank you all so much for all the great questions. Uh, we will try and follow up with everybody uh, with answers to those questions uh, after the webinar over the next couple of days. And again, we will uh, be sending out a link to download the recording later. Um, so everybody that registered should get that link. Um, and with that, you know, thank you so much to our panelists for presenting their projects. Um, and uh, yeah, good thing. have a thank good you, day. Kelly. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. Yeah, thank you.